Hello. In this video, I'm going to talk about an approach to multi-step synthesis problems. Uh, if you've been watching the earlier videos in my series on organic synthesis, then you already know what my approach is going to be. Uh, so if we're given a problem where we are asked to propose a synthesis for a certain transformation, we don't know how many steps this is going to be. Uh, sometimes people who write these problems are, are kind and give us an idea, like three to five steps. Uh, but usually we don't know. Uh, our approach is going to be to break this synthesis down into a series of one-step synthesis problems. Um, <clears throat> and there are two ways that you can go about this. Um, you can go about this in a, on a sort of a forward direction or you know, what can our starting material do? Or you can think about this in reverse, which is like, what does my last step look like? Um, and this particular uh, reverse strategy has a name. It's called retro synthesis, and it is an approach that's used a lot uh, by folks who do organic synthesis for a living. Um, because very often in the real world, you don't even know what your uh, starting material is going to be. You, know, you have some molecule that you are trying to synthesize, uh, and it's complicated, and it's got a lot of stuff in it. And you're trying to, to sort of conceptually break it down into smaller pieces by working backwards uh, through synthetic steps to something you might be able to easily get your hands on. From a starting perspective, when you're just starting to work with synthesis problems, uh, you often have a, a starting material given to you. Um, and so in that case, sometimes you can work forward because you have a starting material that can only do a handful of things. Um, I actually, on this kind of problems, when I have a starting material and a target material, and you need the target material, but when I have the starting and the target material, I kind of work towards the middle. Uh, I think about forward, I think about reverse, and, and I see if I can work towards a, a common intermediate in the middle. And that basically comes down to breaking this synthesis down into a series of one-step synthesis problems. Uh, so I'm going to do an example of for forward thinking and reverse thinking and see uh, where we get to uh, on, on that, see if we can get to things that start to look uh, similar. OK. So if we start by thinking about moving forward, what we are asking ourselves is, what can our starting material do? And, and this is a good question for some kinds of molecules uh, like uh, alkanes. Alkanes have you know no other functional groups going on, can only do basically one useful, synthetically useful reaction. They can undergo radical halogenation to put a halogen on, oops, every time. My program really wants me to, to use real elements and not placeholders. And for our starting compound, because it's symmetric, we have two different places where you can put a halogen. And if you know some things about radical halogenation, the first product is the major product when our, our halogen is bromine. And the second product is the major product when X is when our halogen is chlorine. And then it's going to be up to, to us to figure out which conditions we might use and which one of these we want to use. Um, and you might already be looking at these two possible outcomes and thinking, one of these looks more useful than the other. I'll come back to that. Uh, thinking in reverse or, or retro synthetically, we can ask ourselves, how do I make 
this product. And uh, retrosynthesis uses a special kind of arrow to represent our thinking. Right? And, and we use this open, bold, white arrow, which is uh, actually comes to us from the logic in, in both philosophy and mathematics. This is the implies arrow. So the, the idea here is that a certain target implies that it was made from a, a certain precursor intermediate. Now, again, depending on where you are in your studies of organic chemistry, you might know several reactions that could be used to synthesize this alkene. Uh, uh, and let's talk about them. Uh, generally, the first one that might come to your mind, or at least the first one that comes to my mind, uh, is an elimination reaction. And so you would need a leaving group. Um, and there's actually, there's, you know, two places you can put that leaving group. Uh, I'm going to choose this one. Um, I'm going to choose this one because this is a place where we have a different, uh, oops, the difference in regioselectivity, if I'd have chosen to put the leaving group on the other carbon that's in the alkene, uh, I'd have secondary, secondary on both sides, and it'd be hard to predict whether there'd be any regioselectivity. But under E2 reaction conditions with the appropriate base, something that has a leaving group at this position can undergo uh, an elimination and with make this alkene in the major product. Um, another reaction that you might have thought of is, well, we know we can make uh, alkenes by partial reduction of alkynes. That's true. We can make alkenes by partial reduction of alkynes. And then, you know, again, depending on where you are, you might know that this alkene could be made by Wittig reaction. Uh, or some other kind of reaction. But we're going to just compare, uh, for the sake of simplicity, these two approaches, which are usually studied pretty early in organic chemistry. So now I have, in my forward direction, two possibilities, and in my reverse direction, two possibilities. And what I want to tell you is that each possibility in both cases might actually represent a legitimate pathway for the transformation you're trying to achieve. There'll be different numbers of steps and different reactions, but you may actually be able to get this to work using either possible first step and either possible last step. In this video, though, I'm going to, to try to guide you towards a particular combination that look like they're going towards the same intermediate, uh, and then we'll put together the forward synthesis. All right? um, because if you remember that the original synthesis problem up here at the top, and you go back to thinking about your synthesis toolbox, there's something you should be, who should already be thinking I need to do. Right? And I haven't talked about that, but thinking about, you know, your synthesis toolbox has three parts. What function, what can I do to, to specific functional groups? That's my forward direction. How do I make specific functional groups? That's my reverse or retro synthesis direction. And the third one is, do I have a change in the number of carbons? And in this case, right, because then I can, you know, I've changed in the carbon skeleton. And here I do. There are four carbon atoms in the react on the starting material and seven in the target. Okay. So we have a change in carbon skeleton and we know that there are some reactions that we can use to make that happen. 
And then again, depending on where you are, you, you there are several different carbon-carbon bond forming reactions, but you might recognize uh, one of them, we've kind of got a, almost set up, right? We know that we can react uh, alkynes. We can alkylate alkynes to make uh, to make new carbon-carbon bonds. Okay. So our retrosynthesis suggests we may want to alkylate an alkyne. And what do we need? Uh, what do we need to to alkylate? Because we have this alkyne intermediate. What do we need to alkylate an alkyne? Well, we need uh, a hydrocarbon with a leaving group, and we need a terminal alkyne with a hydrogen that we can deprotonate. Let's see, I want to label this as. Or, or I'm sorry, I want to label this as R prime because it just can be different. Right. And if you have these two things together with the appropriate base, then we generate a new, we generate a, a, an alkyne that has uh, a new carbon carbon bond in it, an internal alkyne. And so now we can actually look and say, well, wait a minute. One of our first steps has uh, generates a molecule, has a leaving group right where we want that new carbon-carbon bond to go. And, and as I was talking earlier, I hinted that some of you might have noticed that. And if you didn't, that's okay. Practice will help. But... You know, from our first step perspective, we have a molecule that has a leaving group at, you know, where we want a new carbon-carbon bond. So that's a good thing. We like this one. And, right, we know that we can do alkyne alkylation uh, to make maybe that new carbon-carbon bond. And so here we have an alkyne that we got from the retrosynthesis. Now, all we need to do um, is put the pieces together in order. And you'll notice that up to this point, I still haven't talked about any specific reagents uh, or conditions. Right? I've just talked about the types of reactions and transformations that need to happen. What I'm going to do now is assemble the pieces that we have into a synthetic sequence. This is our sequence of one step synthesis problems. Uh, come on. And now all we need to do in what we're working on is fill in the reagents. Okay. So our first and our first step involves uh, radical halogenation with chlorine. The reagents that we need for that are chlorine, molecular chlorine and UV irradiation or some other way of generating um, a radical. In this second step, we need a, a, a terminal alkyne and we're gonna make this carbon-carbon bond. So we actually need a, this terminal alkyne. And I'm drawing this down here on purpose. Uh, because I actually want to take a moment and remind us that these these things come from somewhere. Uh, in the the sake for the sake of the the synthesis, we do not necessarily need 
to indicate where this acetylide anion comes from, though it's uh, sometimes nice to do so. Um, we can use any appropriately really strong base like sodium amide to deprotonate that terminal alkyne. And then, I'm going to, to do something. Right. And then we're going to use this acetylide anion as our reagent in the second step. And now we have, we're going to form this carbon-carbon bond. Now we have our alkyne. We want to make the trans alkene. And there, we want to choose a partial reduction of an alkyne. And we want to make, we want to choose the one that makes trans, which that's sodium and ammonia. And, and here we have it. So here is our synthetic sequence, starting with 2-methylpropane and ending with you know, trans-5-methyl to hexene. Uh, in the next video, I'm going to do one more example. Like I'm walking through this process, but, but not necessarily spending as much time explaining each individual step. Um, for uh, another molecule. And I also want to, to share with you that if you started, when I started this video, looking at this synthesis and came up with a different synthetic sequence, that's okay. Um, there is a, a couple of other perfectly valid synthetic sequences starting uh, with 2-methylpropane and ending with 5-methyl-2-hexene uh, uh, using a variety of different reagents. So don't worry, you know, as I mentioned in an earlier video, we're getting into the world where there are more than one pot right answer. And it might be disconcerting at first, but it frees you to find the pathway that works for you. Thank you for watching.